Hi, everybody. I'm Ralph ben Mergi. Welcome to Not That Kind of Rabbi. As always, I will clarify, I am not a cleric. I am not a rabbi. But if I was, I wouldn't be that kind of rabbi. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Would you? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Lots of interesting people to talk to all through this uh, podcast series. And I have one standing by as we... Uh, as I speak, because we're not speaking yet. But I did want to sort of frame this conversation a bit. Um, I guess my fundamental question will be, uh, does capitalism have a soul? Is there such a, a thing? Is it a compatible idea to look at utility, look at monetary value, look at... There's a one book called One Market Under God that was written about 15 years ago. And it was about the sort of how we've made markets divine, that if you just leave them alone, they will magically and perfectly create a world for you that is just and, and right, and that no other system could possibly capture the human endeavor in the same way. And I've always had a real big problem with that because, you know, the reality of the street is, is a different thing. And there are pieces of capitalism that move in one direction and pieces that move in another direction. So there's a, there's even a, a green capitalism now, right? The clean capitalism it's called. And then there's the neoliberal capitalist. And I think one of the fundamental things that I always thought was being told to me through that lens, the neoliberal lens was, you know, look, there are winners and losers in the world. Get out of the way of the winners let them win, and they'll take care of the rest of us, the losers. But if you don't, then you're just trying to flatten everyone so that they all get a little bit of nothing. And I, I think that permeates a lot of kind of public and political discourse that I've encountered in my life in politics, in my life in journalism, uh, and in my life in spiritual pursuits. So, uh, you know, there's always that saying, the price of everything and the value of nothing. That you can always say, well, look, that we're, uh, one of the things going on in the United States these days is when people talk about social movements, they say, well, where are you going to find the money? And then some of the retorts that I think are interesting is nobody seems to ask that question when you're building an F-35 jet and you're spending 96 to $122 million per jet. Uh, there's the money, you know, because you need the jet. Uh, so as always, that kind of thinking is really about what are your priorities. And so for a, through a spiritual lens, where does capitalism land? I've, I'm figuring that out today with Lou Skeezus. And Lou and I have never met, but Lou is the happy capitalist and has happy capital, is it happycapitalist.com? Happycapitalism. Dot com. Look at the way you said that. Yeah. Zim. <laughs> well, just so that we understand <laughs> where they can come and interact with me, Ralph. So uh, um, with Ben Murgy as a last name, I get a lot of, where, where's, where's that from? So Skeezus. What is, My father was born in Greece. Ah. And your mother? Uh, French Canadian from Quebec. Wow. Where did they meet? Montreal. And what was he doing at the time? He was a student at McGill. He was studying marine engineering. My mother was a student uh, in uh, what was used to be called dietetics. Oh, yeah. At the University of Montreal. Oh, cool. So you grew up in Montreal? No, I was born in Montreal. I grew up in New York City because my father got a job with uh, the Onassis Group of Companies. Oh, my. Their North American operation called Central America Corporation. Right. So he was their chief superintendent engineer. So he's running all over North and South America, around the world, essentially, fixing boats and making sure that they didn't break down at an inopportune time. So preventative maintenance as well. So he was always on the way somewhere? Was yeah, he, he was away a lot. He was, uh, you know, on the water or, you know, in a port uh, supervising repairs and maintenance and so on. I've always wondered, because my dad was home. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a shift worker, but he mm -hmm. was home. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like to, to have dad go away all the time? It was great. Yeah? Well, my mother run a, uh, ran a tight ship. Right. I right. mean, one of her prevailing philosophies uh, uh, were, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. So we all had jobs to do. We all did them. And if we failed to do them, there were consequences. Right. Because she was one person with three children underfoot and everybody had to do what they were asked to do 
on a timely basis. Where are you in the three children? I'm in the middle. Ah, the middle child. Right. Right. And what were some of your jobs? Uh, for me? Yeah. Uh, whatever my mother asked me to do. Um, you know, mow the lawn, uh, shovel the snow, uh, take out the garbage, and Just, do it promptly. Uh, uh, you know, once was enough to be asked. So it was kind of like the just-in-time... Well, you had to do what needed to be done. Right. I mean, it was too much. Like, you know, yeah, are you a parent? Ta- yeah, we are had you- tasks. Like right. We, we had, I did uh, laundry in the in the basement of the apartment. Right. And get, here's the quarters, go do the laundry. Right. Uh, and I did vacuuming. Okay. With the Eaton's Viking vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the vacuuming gig, but, um, I you liked know. the vacuuming gig. It was tangible. You know, you went over the carpet and it was now looked better than it had 10 minutes ago. So right. So it needed to be done. And, you know, you're a parent yourself? Yes, I have four children. Okay. So you know that uh, it's not a one-man job, right? No. You know, so four on one would be insurmountable. Four on two is barely manageable. Right. So in a way, your mother was teaching you the transactional nature of things of you do this, you get you get to well, eat. you 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 know. Well, yeah. I mean, she wasn't going to deprive you of food, but no. But she made it clear that <laughs> she didn't have time, right, to ask twice, right, right, and that had consequences throughout, right. So some kids would go out and make lemonade stands and be entrepreneur. Were you an entrepreneurial kid? Sure. I mean, you know, mentioning mowing lawns and s- shoveling snow. You know, snow on the streets meant gold in the streets. You'd yeah. go out. Your neighbors were happy to pay you. They don't do that anymore. Well, because they have other things to do, right? Like kids today have a lot more after-school activities than we ever had. Right. So how much did you charge per sidewalk and driveway? As much as I could. (laughs) Right. So, you know, I tried to figure out what the what market What the market was. demands. Right. What the market will bear. Yes. Not what they demand. They demand, uh, you know, everything for nothing. And you've got to set a price that is uh, satisfying to you. Right. And you then have to be willing to forego those opportunities if they're not at a level that you could consider. Right. No, you don't work for free. Right. Right. But so how does the worker of today fit into that idea? What's their bargaining chip if they're the worker? Well, I mean, doing what? Oh, uh, Amazon you know, delivery warehouse work. If you choose to do that, you'll have to take what's offered. So I, I don't know what they pay at that uh, level. I know that, uh, for example, if you can operate a lift truck right. for certain warehouse environments, you'll make $30 an hour. That's not bad. So when you say choose, it's, there's a philosophy behind the idea that there's choice. Right? Of course, there's always choice. So tell there's always choice. Of course. You don't have to work for Amazon. You can choose someone else. You can inform yourself of opportunities. All right. So let's say in the service industry, you've got people working uh, at minimum wage or part-time so they don't even get minimum wage. Yeah. Or contract to deliver pizza because then you don't really have to do it. But they benefits. choose that. They there choose- are other things that can be done. So they're just making poor choices? I would say. I mean, it's a poverty not only of resources, but choice. So you don't believe that certain people in certain situations have to just, it, they can't get jobs here, they can't get, and so they have to take that next job. Whatever it is. Well, you have to open your eyes and look around and see what the opportunity basis is. Yeah, it's one of the interesting things to me about capitalism is this: uh, the idea that uh, if you're poor, it's that's your problem. You didn't. Well, you can work well. your way out of it. Everyone can. How come? So then, why are all these people poor? Because of a poverty of choice. Poverty of their choice making. Or- yeah. So they're they're not being creative enough. Well, let's look at our society, Ralph, okay? And I don't know where this goes with spirituality, but you want to talk about economics. That's my area of expertise. You know, we're in a society where if you apply yourself, you can get up to grade 12 education at no cost to you, right? It's being paid by society because we want an educated workforce, And then if you've applied yourself and you get into a college or a university, your cost of attending is what I would have to say inflation adjusted hasn't changed much in the last 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Now, you may look at it and say, well, $6,500 a year in tuition to go to a college, that's outrageous. But if you look back to when I went to school and what I paid to go to uh, post-secondary education, uh, I did the inflation adjustment. It's about parallel. 
Mm. So it's really individual. There's no systemic barriers. Oh, there's always barriers. I mean, come on. Well, th- you know, but think you're about it. it sound like well, no, but let's, I can just okay. But we're not talking about historical, right? Like fifty years ago, if you're a woman and you wanted to become a doctor, there were barriers. If you're a woman, you wanted to be a lawyer, there were barriers. If you were a woman and wanted to go to university, there were barriers, and they were systemic. Are there barriers today? Well, I'm sure they there are. Although there's been some addressing of those barriers in terms of gender and racial. Uh, discrimination in terms of educational opportunities and so on. But, you know, it's not a perfect world. You know that, right? Right. I'm just trying to figure out because I get the idea that, you know, your destiny is in your hands. You got to do what you got to do to make it. But I also wonder what's the, what is it as simple as you're not trying hard enough or you're not being smart enough about your choices or is there other th- are there well, other things at play that make it so that it's even harder for some people than others that some people so have a what, head start give, over others? Well, I mean, if if you have if you have an intact family unit, if you have, yeah, if you have an intact family unit and you're all moving together, yeah. right towards the general objective, and you've got you know those kind of fundamentals, you should do okay. So if you're a kid who's there's no high school. Ad- you know, in a reserve north of Thunder Bay. Oh, those are those are failed communities. Let's be clear about right. that. Right. So their opportunity space is quite small. Sorry, you know, I mean, if I was uh, living in a community where the community standard was, you know, rampant alcohol abuse and uh, personal abuse and physical abuse and child abuse and uh, spousal abuse and so on, I would choose to leave. And do what? Just well, just to get out of that environment, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, from my knowledge, and I'm no expert in that field, but what I've read would suggest that it, they're not healthy communities. And so, of course not. so, you know, why continue to habitate a failed community? So in a low-income neighborhood where there's uh, unemployment and uh, racial racialization and, you know, uh, stopped in a car for on suspicion of being black and all these things going on. Do they have that same opportunity space as a white male from a university educated pair of parents? Uh, apparently not. I mean, you know, the, the, the fact is they are, they still have access to education and they have to uh, avoid all of the traps that might keep them from accomplishing that. Right. And that's a family unit. Uh, growing up, was there a, a religious life for you or a spiritual life for you? Well, and your family? I, I was, uh, yes, my mother was a devout Roman Catholic. My father was a Greek Orthodox, right, in their terms of their indoctrination and so on. I went through. So you uh, had two Christmases? Um, not, we really didn't you get didn't that. Do the Julian yeah, calendar no, one? no, we didn't get the. Bummer. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, there are economics <laughs> that go with that. Listen, right? the Julian <laughs> one's better because everything's on sale by then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I went to a Catholic uh, elementary school mm. uh, through grade eight. And after that, I kind of abandoned that failed institution. So for you, uh, in those years till grade eight, you mm-hmm. were being indoctrinated into the Catholic faith. Right. They expected me, because I have a gift of gab, right. to be, you know, they were measuring me for a cassock. Right. Right. Oh, this one's going to be good. We're going to have him out there recruiting and fundraising and the whole <laughs> shebang, right? And I didn't want anything to do with them after eight years of Catholic education. Why not? I, they talked the talk. They didn't walk the walk. I mean, essentially, right? Yeah. Like, you know, uh, turn the other cheek, you know. So that there's Sister Betrayal, you know, beating a student's head against the blackboard. I said, well, it doesn't seem to go with the message. Right. And, you know, people who uh, profess to be, you know, all these uh, serious Catholics, right, not behaving within the dogma right. that they're preaching, I said, you know, I don't really need a lot of that. I'm, I'm smart enough to know you're full of it. You know, the Pope's encyclicals about capitalism are mm-hmm. not very flattering to Which capitalism. Which Pope? The, the present Pope and... Uh, the oh, you mean the guy who's perpetuating the uh, cross-dressing pedophile cult? Passing pedophiles from one community to the... I should respect anything he has to say about capitalism? I don't think I will. 
Right. So when you read Catholic, I don't, I don't read. Do. I don't. Well, there there is a sort of a. They're whole, a failed institution, and they should have their tax free status. Uh, taken away from them. Would you say that about most religions? I would say that most of them are modeled on a cult. And uh, I think that when you scrape under the surface of organized religion, scandalous. So what would you say to people who uh, talk about secularists uh, who, who really believe that the business model of capitalism works for them, um, that they worship money? What, what does anybody ever say that to you? Oh, you worship money. Well, people try and put that on me. How, I don't. I, I'm not that kind of guy. Like, I, first of all, I wouldn't put it on you. But right. secondly, I've never had anybody say that because I don't think I, I qualify as a, a, a entrepreneurial capitalist. So, right. um, what do you think they're really trying to say to you, and how do you feel when they say it? Um, well, I I basically tell them that you know money is just a tool for me. It accomplishes the things I want to see in the world around me. I can't affect the whole world, but um, it's a tool. And so, no, we don't worship money. We use it to accomplish the things that we want. The things that drive capitalism are efficiency and effectiveness. And if you're not being effective and efficient, we lose interest in you because you don't get it. So how does... 2008 in the United States fit into that conversation in your head? Well, that was uh, a fraud perpetrated on all Americans and the global community by people that were never called to task for their uh, fraudulent behavior. And it was predominantly in the uh, subprime mortgage area Mm -hmm. where uh, characters that had bought off regulators, right? Mm -hmm. There was a guy named uh, 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 Angelo Mazzillo from Countrywide Financial. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No. Okay, so Angelo had a list uh, at Countrywide Financial called Friends of Angelo, and all of the leaders of the House and Senate banking committees were Friends of Angelo's, and if they wanted a mortgage or a loan, they got one. Right. That's buying off the regulator, right? right? So a fraud was perpetrated on the American taxpayer, And there was no retribution. Now, at the time, I was on the radio calling for public trials and public executions of those characters because at the time, if you recall, the U.S. was in an active uh, combat role in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And I said, you know, times of war, people messing with the economy, they're traitors, shoot them and be Mm. done with it. But they didn't. Mm. So it became um, kind of a buyout. And uh, unfortunately, it's nothing I agreed with. The bailouts were not anything I would have suggested. What would you have done? I would have allowed the market to consolidate. So when General Motors, you know, had its uh, head in its hands and going to Congress for a bailout, the only survivors should have been the Ford Motor Company. They had the financial resources to take over GM and Chrysler and consolidate it. So I guess that speaks to the idea Two things. One is every system has parts of it that are more vulnerable to tendencies than others. Well, what tendency are you suggesting? Well, in this one, I would suggest greed. Well, no, it was fraud. Well, but yeah. fraud, you do a fraud because of your greed. You don't no, just you do, do a it fraud because you it like can it. be done. Because you can buy off so the it's regulator. just opportunity. Yeah. But there's no moral part to that? Like How can ma- it be moral when you're... No, or immoral. Like, it is, where, what's the moral component of perpetrating a fraud? Well, it's a crime. Besides being a crime. No, 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 no. Let's not say besides. It's a crime that was not pursued, and there was no conviction. So let's know, not get into the... But what's the motivation of the person doing it? Power. Power over others. So you seem adverse to the word greed. No, I'm not adverse to it. I just don't believe that's the driver. Because they were already wealthy. Well, you so know, they wanted more power over others. Is money power? Money's a tool, of course. Right. It's got, you know, I mean, man needs energy to do work. And some of that energy is uh, kind of in, in, encased in money. Right. Money you, with money, you can do work. How important is that to, to, how important, I know you say it's a tool. 
That's all it but is. But it's a very important tool, right? But it's just the tool. And, you, you know, it, it comes with no instructions. Do this with your money. Do that with your money. Right. You can do whatever you want with it. You can use it productively or you can waste it and bemoan your loss. All right, let's continue on the spiritual path. You, you gave up on religion, clearly. Right. Yeah, organized religion to me are failed institutions. So you go through your teen years where mm-hmm. it's okay to not need any of that, and then you go into your life and you have, do you have kids? I have a child. Right. Um, and for a lot of people, that's where they sort of have to figure out, what am I going to do with that kid about this? So world? my my wife is uh, comes from an ultra-Catholic background. Uh, she uh, used to be more uh, dogmatic about that. Two of her, three of her uncles were Catholic priests. Wow. Her mother, you know, uh, deep Catholic uh, faith and so on. And I just, you know, said, well, you know, if you want to impose that on Madeline, right, I want you to make sure you keep an eye on the, uh, the leaders, if you will, of that whole structure, right, to make sure she doesn't become a victim. Right. And over the course of my daughter's life, she rejected the entire uh, dogmatic approach as well. Mm. So, you know, we're kind of out of it. My daughter will go with my wife to Christmas mass and so on, right. just as some kind of social thing. Right. It's like- and she likes the children's math and uh, mass at uh, Christmas time because the kids sing choir and yeah. so on and so on. Like Jews doing high holidays. I guess. Yeah, that's what we do. I don't participate. Well, you could come. Uh, I don't participate in, well. Come with me next time. Well, well, great time. No, I'm saying, I, you know, when my wife and daughter go, I've, I've kind of you know, said, I played along for a while when, when I was first married, right? right. So, okay, I'll try it. I'll try and reintroduce myself because it was important to her. Right. And I realized it was just a one-way communications. I am the uh, middleman between you and, you know, the spirit world or right. God or whatever right. you want to call it. And you will listen to me and I will talk to you. And then, you know, whatever you have to say or do is unimportant to us. I said, you know what, I've had enough. When you were a kid, who was Jesus to you? Like, what, what did Jesus mean when you were still, like, you know, before grade eight? Uh, you know, it, it was just a, an idea, a concept, a, uh, I mean, you know, when, you look, when I looked at my religious education, right, because I was baptized, I was confirmed, I think that's as far as I went, um, you know, the Ten Commandments were okay, Ten good rules. Don't kill anybody. Don't steal from anybody. Don't, you know, uh, shag the, uh, the neighbor's wife and so on and so on. Respect try and, your parents. Yeah, I mean, just try. Those were fairly easy to understand and implement. Right. So that's about, and Jesus as a historical figure might have been, might not have been. You, I mean, you never saw Jesus as a divine figure? Kind of hard to. For some. Well, yeah. <laughs> for I mean, others, quite easy. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends what floats your boat. Like yeah, for me, yeah. I look at it and say, well, you know, interesting idea. You know, uh, I mean, as a historical figure, um, you know, he thought he was the Messiah or others thought he was the Messiah. And it turned out that uh, whatever his life was about, you know, it was snuffed out pretty quickly. Right. right. So has anything replaced that for you spiritually or is that just... Over there. Well, you know, I, I definitely believe that there's something other than, you know, this little tribe of mammals that dominate this planet, right? right? I just don't know what it is. And you don't explore that? What do you mean? Well, I mean, that's a question. Do you pursue that question? What it, could it be? Or do you I, I believe find that ways some, to access it? Well, or? you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time pursuing it, but I will. Are you familiar with the Templeton Prize? Uh, only the name. I'm yeah. not familiar with So, the Sir John Templeton, I had the opportunity to interview him on my radio show in Calgary. And uh, he was the founder of the Templeton Group of Funds. Right. So, he was one of the first characters in the post war era to recognize the opportunities to uh, profit from the growth in the global economy after the devastation of World War II. And he um, was a, a very devout Presbyterian, and he ended up, when I was talking, he was an 80-some-odd-year-old billionaire, and he had funded the Templeton Prize uh, to pursue research in religion. 
So he, he looked at the world and said, well, there's prizes for engineering and there's prizes for science and there's prizes for this and this and this, but there's nobody spending any time or money pursuing research in religion. So he uh, started a committee that reviews those that are participating in the spiritual uh, environment and awarding a $3 million prize per year. It's the largest cash prize uh, given in the world. And, um, you know, I, I've seen some of the, uh, the recipients, like Mother Teresa and so on and so on, and, you know, some of the things that they had to say about the spiritual world in, um, in its active phase in humanity, mm-hmm. that's about it, right? right. That's the only uh, amount of research that I have done right. in that area. So where do you get your sense of community? Me? Yeah. Well, Toronto Mike, of course. Yes, of course. You know, because he has created this uh, opportunity f- for me to meet some like-minded people and some people that I want nothing to do with, right? And that's the nature of my personality. If you get it, I got time for you. If you don't get it, I don't want anything to do with you because you're a waste of my time. And that's my only real asset is my time. When you were saying that, I was thinking, do you, if, if you, if you don't agree with someone? No, you got to get it. Like, well, get what? Well, that it's your life. What do you want to do with it? And how much of that is material? Um, I think it depends on what you want. Like money's wasted on me. Okay. I make money, but not for me. I make it so that my daughter, you know, can pursue the things that are in passion her. Why? It's my responsibility as a parent. When she was 11, she gave you her first invoice. Is that right? Uh, was she 11? She, I think she was 11. Um, I had asked her to, to do, uh, some, you know, she's much better with technology than I am. So I asked her to videotape, uh, on her phone and then, uh, edit it. And she gave me her invoice. I think she was 11. I'd have to look cause I have it in a file somewhere. Why did you, why did the invoice enter it? Why? Yeah. Because I mean, I'm, I'm trying to imbue her with the sense of what you got to do if you're going to work for yourself and you can do the work, but if you don't collect, you know, if you don't do the administration of the work, you don't get paid. So what do you say to the people who talk about uh, <clears throat> a more uh, social democratic what does kind that mean? of world? What does that mean? Well, it would be, think of the Norway, Finland, Sweden kind of I've models. I've never been there. High welfare state, high taxes. Um, How's it working uh, out? Actually pretty well. Life According expectancy. To who? Uh, is very high. High uh, suicide rate in those countries? No, not mm-hmm. any higher than Manitoba on a dark winter <laughs> night. <laughs> okay, Manitoba is its own Well, hey, universe. so, th- okay. you know, that's a different story. No, I, But th- it's not th- bucolic, th- right? No, I mean, no, I'm not trying to well, tell you. Well, you're trying to, to no, tell no, me no, that t- it's You better. asked me, how's it going? In other words, you were saying, how's that working for you? Yeah. Well, you know, on the other hand, without knowing that there are actual happiness statistics or the way people live their lives and whether they feel like they're taken care of, whether there's a safety net, uh, how they feel about taxes. You know, all of these things are things where in our culture, we have taken it to say, for for instance, politically, I work in political communications with people sometimes. Mm -hmm. You're never allowed to say the word tax. It's, It's a swear word. It's taking money from you. It's your money. And I find spiritually it makes life very small to think like that, that it's, there's, there's certain things we can't afford on our own that we need to pool our resources to get like a fire truck. It costs a lot of money. So it's good if they show up as well, if there's actually a fire, you know, in today's universe with the improvement in uh, building materials and fire suppression systems, we really don't need them. And when you see them out and about the majority of times they're out at an auto accident, a a fender bender, just to tick the box on activities. How many calls did you make? Oh, we made all these calls. How many were fires? Very few. So I would posit. Do you need police officers? Do you Pardon need, me? A, do you okay, need a so health system? Okay, need, let me just walk you through each one of these examples. They're all a waste of money? Okay, so let me just walk you through. What did I say? Efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, so we have a fire department that is no longer needed 
as they were 100 years ago to put out as many fires, right? So they have redeployed themselves to be traffic barriers at fender benders. You realize that, right? I think you're oversimplifying. No, I am giving you the facts. And if you want to do the research, you go right ahead. Okay, police. Have you ever seen the Toronto Police Service uh, issue a force deployment audit? No. So we have an army, a paramilitary group called the Toronto Police Service, and there's police services everywhere. And where are they positioned? I would say that if I was uh, the commander of a paramilitary group, I'd be uh, deploying them where there was violence and crime. They're not. It's a early retirement program for people standing on street corners and writing tickets. Wow. That, yeah. You have a very jaundiced view no, of it's pub- not jaundiced. public it's, services. Well, it's a pyramid of extortion. When you look at an economy like ours, where 58% of GDP is attributed to government. That money has come from somebody and they've borrowed in order to spend it on the pyramid of extortion, which is populated by the minions of the system. Okay. So I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to find where's the heartfulness, the compassion. Well, no, wait, how does that, how do we go from, Critical analysis to now you want to well, do critical the, the, analysis. It's it's your particular point of view. No, no, about it's a those fact. Services it's their a fact. If you actually wanted to, is my uh, is my oncologist a waste of tax dollars? Uh, how are they doing on curing cancer? Uh, in my case, really well. Okay, well, good for you. So, so what you know, you have you're going specific- down to anecdotal pieces when I'm saying. There are a whole bunch of people who believe that paying taxes are a bad thing, but th- also what How happens about being there, effective okay, and efficient. Minute, what happens there is that you end up with this libertarian idea that the private sector is always better and always no, is more effective. No, I didn't say that. Do you think the private sector is more effective? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You know what I think? I think there's better ways to measure outcomes. And we get all kinds of, uh, how do you feel about it, blah, 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 without measuring the outcome. So, so do you believe well, in taxes? I believe that there's a fair amount of tax that, you know, people, Are we there or are we way too high? Well, I, you know, if you've uh, followed my career at all, you'd know that I'm interested in exploring uh, what they're doing in Singapore where the income tax is 10% and the capital gains tax is zero. Because that will stimulate the economy? Is that no, because idea? when you do that, the sound of capital coming to your country is deafening. And once you're into aggregating capital, the economy tends to do pretty good. So Singapore being a city-state function, yeah. Yeah. quite small. So should we decentralize things? Well, I think that, you know, it's what we have is not effective or efficient. So I, just to get back to the police uh, analogy, mm. okay, it, does it make sense to pay, I don't know, some number of thousands of police officers $100,000 a year? to do things like patrol? Or can we get people at a lower cost to do those kinds of things? Every year, colleges across the country have a police fundamentals course that rip and strip tuition money out of kids that want to get to be a policeman because they make six figures a year and they get a pension, and then they end up being a mall cop. Yeah. How about just saying, okay, we're going to take the budget, the billion plus in Toronto for the police budget? Right. Right. And we're going to deploy it differently. So instead of having, you know, the SWAT team with the truck and everything else, you know, how about we just have more people on the street as an observer of what's going on and a reporter to the armed uh, paramilitary group? All right. So how smaller paramilitary, more observers. how, How do you feel about on a city block, 40 houses, 40 lawnmowers? Would you? like the idea of 10 lawnmowers and you sign them up on online and say, I'd like to it's use possible. a Saturday from it could 11 work. to two might work. I'm just trying to figure out where we share instead of where we keep. I don't want to have a lawnmower. Right. Right. Uh, but we're but, set up for high consumerism, right? We're set well, up I don't for know. I mean, you can, you can choose 
You, to well, do, you could choose. You need other people to cooperate if you want to no, well, I mean, share a lawnmower. You know, I heard you today on Humble and Fred saying, you know, your clothing is from Value Village. Yes. I shop in the same you, place. Thank you God you're not my size. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yesterday I was at the, um, uh, Salvation Army yes. in Oakville and I picked up a, you know, one of those carriers for the dogs. Yes. A for $6. Small one. Right. The one that you would yeah, put yeah. a dog in to for put on a plane. A vet or six bucks. Six bucks. Retail. What do you figure that is? 50, 60? Oh, more. Yeah. So there's plenty of opportunities to, you know, find a lawnmower, Right. Right, but I'm talking about a community feeling connected as opposed to everybody in their own place doing their own okay, thing. Okay, so here's the problem with sharing. There's the, he's always using it. I never get a chance to get it, blah, blah, blah. I was on an office floor, shared accommodation in Calgary, where all of us had uh, our own office, but we shared boardrooms, right. right? And there was no rules about, you know, how many times a month and this and that. So my partner and I... There's the first mistake, by the way. What's that? No rules to when you... Well, I, you know, I didn't set the agenda. Right. And, you know, so we were very active in uh, prospecting and so on for clients. We used a lot of boardroom time. Right. And people started complaining. I said, well, I thought it was a first come, first serve. No, we're going we're gonna to regulate you. And I said, well, I, don't, I didn't have that understanding when I signed this lease. What do people say... What do you say about, because I've, I've read books uh, in this vein, and I found them interesting, that there is this belief that the so-called free market is really got a kind of a magical piece to it, that things will come together the way they're supposed to if you just get out of the way. Well, I think that if you look at a country like ours, where you know 58% of GDP is attributable to government, I don't think there's a lot of free market. I think there's more of a regulated market or a government market, right, where the employees, right, have to come first. I mean, you know, government employees, they have a better pay scale and a better pension than you're ever going to have, more sick days than you're ever going to have. But don't you want everyone to have good pensions? That's not – when you look at revenue, yeah, it's got to come from somewhere, right? So if 48% of your economy is driven by the um, – sorry, uh, 58% is driven by the 42% that are actually contributing to the tax base. You're How? assuming civil servants don't contribute? I think they're takers. They pay taxes. And actually, where did the more money, money they, they make, the, the more money? taxes they make. Okay, but they, where did they, the money come from to pay them? It's come from okay, the, but it, hold on, you, from you people that- regulation is of no use to you. It generally isn't. Well, I you see, I think that's patent nonsense. Because well, again, that's you really, know, your if, opinion. No, no, it's more than my opinion. If, if no one regulates how you manufacture something and you can get away with manufacturing Okay, so it let's poorly, just talk about, regu will. let's talk about regulation. Like a, a Cairo let me apartment building Let me give you an example. <laughs> there was a regulation that the government of Canada would take children from indigenous families and put them into group homes where they were sexually abused. Now, that was a regulation and the outcome was catastrophic. Okay, and they're still trying to okay. unwind. You know you're cherry picking, right? Well, so are you when you're giving me no, an example I'm about an apartment to say that building. Health and safety standards are important things to have, are they not? Well, I, I would assume like if so. If you have but to build to code, if you have to make sure that the water is clean, hi, if you have to everything make sure all those that is built is built by the lowest cost bid. So no matter what the In code is. a framework of regulations that require a certain amount of build. But. They all, it's always the low cost yeah. bidder that builds. So what do you believe in? I believe that um, you're on your own. You better figure it out. You better stop looking at your neighbor to pay your bills. You know, when you come to me with the concept of affordable housing, that's really code for I can't afford a house and you should pay for it. And what I say is, you know, maybe you got to get another job. Maybe you got to look at your spending. Maybe you need to crowd Ralph and Lou out of the value village stream. Maybe you need to cook at home. Maybe you need to bring those values of enterprise into your life as opposed to always looking to somebody else. You're on your own. And if you're, so you live alone, you die alone? Well, the way it works? You, you take somebody with you? Are you one of well, those crazy alone, well, gun guys with a suicide, with kill the family, well, kill myself? There are people around you sometimes when, if you're lucky when you're dying. And sometimes it's usually a paid attendant isn't it 
It might be for you. Well, I, by observation, <laughs> the statistical norm is people die alone. But you, it, it sounds like you have a certain cynicism about all this. No, it's just that I haven't bought into the same value program that you have. I have a different view of this reality. That you're on your own. Well, aren't you? Well, I'd like to think that we're all walking each other home. Uh, you know, you better watch who you're walking with and who's walking your kids home, right? You know, there was just an outrage in Hamilton with the uh, perpetrator of child sexual abuse at Maple Leaf Gardens. You know, he's in a yeah. group home, he's on his own, and all the kids that he abused, you know, well, too bad. You know, he, he did his time. Not really. So you got to watch the kids, What would you right? have done with him? Oh, he'd be in the ground for sure. You'd kill him. Oh, 45 caliber solution. Absolutely no question you, asked. You tough heart you have. I don't have a tough heart. You know what? There's no sense, you know, uh, the shepherd needs to keep the wolves away from the lambs, right? You get a wolf near your lambs, you got to put them down. They don't get any better. They're wolves. They're predators. So when it comes to the employer who, who exploits the worker in a, in a way that's cruel... Such as I've worked for, you know, let's say that's real world. Let's say there's part of it. Yeah. And, but also shithead is easy. Let's oh. say there's somebody who's truly exploiting a worker to a point of, well, describe it. Like what would that be? Well, let's say you have to find a way to admit that this does go on in the world. I mean, to pretend that we're in some wonderfully benevolent. No, I'm not work pretending. I'm asking you. I'm asking you to. What do does it matter what my example is? Let's say that's happening. I can't address a fantasy. Yes, you can. You oh, can okay. address a relationship. Let's say there is it's an employer. a master slave relationship, and you have to decide how much you're going to take for the money being offered. Like, so, I have a thing called a reservation wage. Right. If you pay that wage, I'll put up with you and your nonsense, right? And right. if it's below that, I won't even engage. And if, if the nonsense starts to exceed my reservation wage, I move on. Do you think you come from any place of privilege in this conversation? How could I? As a white male, you oh. don't have any privilege. Well, let me tell you my experience, okay? I came to this country with $800 in my pocket. Uh -huh. I worked in the construction industry. Uh -huh. to try and get a grub steak together. I also sold the Alberta Report News Magazine at night. I built decks on Saturdays with carpenters from the job sites I was on. And I sold Chinese egg jars at flea markets on Sunday. And I did that for years. And I lived in a boarding house that cost me $400 a month for room and board till I got my grub steak together. I said, okay, I am now no longer pitifully poor. I can start to make some moves in the economy. So your, your narrative is more rags to riches, right? No, my narrative is... Uh, like I, if you were a native person and you had that, that same mean? story. What does that mean? If, if you were I, from the Blood Reserve in southern Alberta and you were the guy who was going to come and build the deck, would you be as welcomed as you were as a white guy? Well, I was the laborer. Granted, so I didn't have a lot of skills. But you were a white guy. Would you? Would you well, it's because been, I knew the guys on this job. It was a relationship. I, I think you're being disingenuous. No, I am not because I you're, can't. You're trying to pretend it's a but you're saying, Lou, pretend, for everyone. Pre, no, but you're saying, Lou, pretend you're somebody you're not. I can't. No, I'm saying acknowledge there are some values to who you are as opposed to having uh, black skin, for instance. There are some okay, values so to that. so in my day, in the 1970s, that's when they brought in affirmative action. Do you remember those days? Sure. Where, you know, they looked at people like me and said, you know, we've had enough of you people. There's got to be room for other people. And I said, well, yeah, that's probably the case. But I know I still got to get mine. Regardless of what your preference is and what your fashion of the day is and all that. Fashion I still, of the day. Well, I mean, you're saying that, you know, here you are. You're just not, the, you just don't fit the suit anymore. So we're going to give your place to somebody else. I say, fine, but I still got to get mine. I got to have a roof over my head. I got to have food on the table. I have to have electricity. Right. I have to have uh, transportation, entertainment, the whole thing that I want. How can I, why would I abandon that mission? Right. So sometimes in spiritual direction work, you ask the question, where is God in all this? Is there any? There's a higher power. There is? Well, I believe so. I told you that at the beginning. 
what what are you and is it just unknowable so you leave it at that well i don't there have, are people lots of people who do that they just I, go look i have no idea but i'm sure something's going on well i believe that there is but you know once it reveals itself i'm there but until then i have to pursue and proceed how will it reveal itself? Well, I don't know. You know, that's the mystery of faith, isn't it? Well, but there's also the pursuit of how uh, some people pursue how to become available to it being there because they'll argue it's always there. You're just not being available to it. it doesn't I've been busy. Hit you with, <laughs> with I've this, been busy. This is what I mean. Is is there a space to make for to be available to bigger things or are you hoping it punches through your busyness? Well, you know, we'll see. You know, if it reveals itself at a time and a place that I can see it, then I guess I would acknowledge it. I have a general belief that there is something better than, you know, this uh, tribe of large mammals that populate the earth right. and dominate the earth. Has it revealed itself to me yet? Do you, I'll say climate crisis, you'll say. Uh, have you noticed where heat comes from? Keep going. From the sun? The sun is this huge uh, furnace with no thermostat to control it. You're aware of that, right? Continue. Okay, so I I believe that the reason that you have you know global warming, if you will, mm. or climate change now. I mean, it's changed. You know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, cloak many times in my lifetime. So I look at it and say, well, you know, we got this uncontrolled furnace out there in the cosmos and you know we depend on it and i think that the sun has been you know giving us a bit of a burn for the last while and i'm i'm okay with it because that's nature so it's not human driven no it's a sun oh please you, could you be any more arrogant to think that it's you that's controlling nature nature controls you i i, I have to say for someone who is empirically driven as yeah. you are it's astounding what you're telling me. Well, you know, because if 98 percent of scientists, which agree, scientists, climate scientists, w well, there aren't it, any, are there? Oh my God! No, 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 no. <laughs> I have no, to no. tell you, like, yeah. honestly, Lou, honestly, the idea that you think this is about a furnace that has no thermostat, as opposed to GHG emissions and hard science and the ability to understand that we are spewing carbon at a rate that is when you say we, who, who are you talking about? You and me and everyone else in this in this system. Well, so the majority of those no, but, gases. But the point is, it's a human endeavor. It's, I disagree. The hottest year. I, 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 don't I even disagree. Know where to begin with you on this one, honestly. Well, I, I'm just going to say, how can you refute? The activity, the solar activity that we live under. Patent nonsense. Absolutely patent nonsense. Based I, I've on listened what? to a lot of good things Based you say. Based on what? Based on what? Based, on your belief do you system. Say, do you want, uh, have you read anything? I have. In really? Fact, you've read IPCC reports? I don't know who IPPC is. And yet you're telling me you're well informed. Well, I'm informed enough to make a decision on what I'm going to pursue. And I'm not going to pursue the case for man's activity on the surface of the earth having an effect on the weather. Wow. It's not weather. It's climate. They're well, it's weather, the, climate. No, they're the same. Thing. They're not the same thing. Okay. Actually. So one's an ecosystem issue. So one are you familiar with a Carrington level issue. event? No, please inform me. Okay. So a Carrington <laughs> level event is when the sun emits electromagnetic pulses to the extent that it destroys electronic gear we're on the verge of a carrington level event from historical measurement mm -hmm. and we're doing nothing about it while we're chasing this myth of greenhouse gases and everything else really yeah it's according to the data that i've read wow so well, the I last mean, one I, was I, I in to... the 1850s right. when uh telegraphs got knocked out because of a carrington level event that's a fact great so you, we're on the verge of having every electronic device that you depend on, your car, your lights, your computers, your internet, your storage, right. whatever, get knocked out in your lifetime. So the, do you read stuff in the Insurance Bureau of Canada, for instance, Not on really. climate change? Not really. Really? Okay, because they work in business models. They do actuarial tables and they do risk assessment. And, and their assessment is that we're in big trouble. Well, no, their assessment is it's going to cost more. 
No, we're in big trouble. Their well, assessment I is disagree. flooding I alone. I disagree. Is well, it's convenient that you disagree. Well, no, it's say. not that it's convenient. It's just that I can see a vested interest. Right. As their concern for catastrophic this and that, premiums go up. Revenue is going with it. So I look and say, okay, it's insurance. You know, I've never seen a premium go down. I've so only it's a seen cash it go- grab? Well, I think it's advantageous. All right. All right, I have to, we have to wrap, but, oh. but I have to say that from a spiritual point of view, from my own life, I find the conversation very disheartening. I find it to be about being alone, about if, if people are bad, just kill them. Uh, if uh, capitalism ha- doesn't need all these hangers on, uh, that we should just, you know, if you really mean it, you'll get it. Uh, and that uh, the world, it's all a bunch of crap about the world having a, a serious crises in terms of its inequality, in terms of its climate, in terms of uh, how we are with each other. Um, and I find that sad. Well, you tell. know, I find it sad that you're uh, embracing this unicorn and rainbow reality without in, without looking at the world around you and how you participate in it. And, you know, I came for a conversation. Yeah. I didn't really come for a lecture. So, you know, I'm, right. I'm saying to you, I find what you're saying to me yes. as sad. Good. Yeah. I mean, the hardest thing is to find the place between us and within us to connect as people. Yeah. Right? Uh, I, I don't ide- find it Ideas can divide. Well... These ideas are very divisive for us, right? We're, we're not, not for feeling me. great. Well, you're not feeling great. You feel great right now? I always feel great. I choose to feel great. Okay. I choose the life that I have. You should do the same. Thank you for the lecture. Loose Jesus and uh, capitalism is a wonderful thing. Happycapitalism.com is his website. Check him out. And... Uh, Uh, I have to say, a very challenging conversation for a person like me because uh, I really don't have the same lens on the world. Uh, And uh, interesting to hear one. Make it a profitable day.
This podcast has been produced by TMDS and accelerated by Rome Phone. Rome Phone brings you the most reliable virtual phone service to run your business and protect your home number from unwanted calls. Visit romephone.ca to get started.